Thank you for inviting me to join you today at the Nuclear Energy Conference 2021 in Austria. I have to admit, I wish I were there in person. My wife Maggie and I have friends in Austria and we've always hoped to visit. Yet, since our daughter is a hospital trauma nurse, we're very aware of the dangers of the COVID pandemic. And we appreciate that you brought together this web-centered event. So thank you very much. I'm honored to be here today, especially with this year's topic, how to dismantle an atomic lie, taking apart nuclear falsehoods. Today's topic is an integral part of my journey as a nuclear whistleblower. I'm a nuclear engineer and I've been so for 50 years. I have two nuclear engineering degrees, a nuclear reactor operator's license, and ultimately I became a senior vice president in the nuclear industry. My journey in atomic power started in 1958 when I was nine years old and my mother took me to New York City to see the Nautilus. Slide three. This first atomic powered submarine had just crossed under the North Pole between the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic. I was enthralled by this atomic powered submarine and visions of Jules Verne's tales peppered my dreams when I imagined travel in the Nautilus. You can remove the slide. When I attended university at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, I chose my study plan as a 20 year old sophomore. The math behind splitting the atom and controlling them in a nuclear reactor captivated me. So I decided on nuclear engineering. Later in life at 40 years old, I knew I had made a colossal mistake. Splitting atoms for nuclear power is rooted in secrecy surrounding atomic bombs as weapons of mass destruction. Like many others my age, I learned that dropping an atomic bomb was allegedly necessary to end a terrible war. My generation was lied to and developed beliefs based on that lie. Studying nuclear engineering, I believed in pursuing the peaceful use of the atom would, <clears throat> would help people worldwide and move us away from atomic war. In 1971, I became a card carrying member of the nuclear priesthood when I began my career as a licensed reactor operator. I progressed to the position of senior vice president during my 20 years of employment with, the nu with nuclear energy corporations. All the time, I believed with religious fervor that helping to build and operate atomic power reactors I would be creating power that was too cheap to meter. The historic 1973 gasoline shortages with long lines of cars queued up at the pump made it clear to me and hundreds of other engineers that atomic power was the only solution to the energy shortage. Therefore, solving this apparent energy shortage was our sole mantra in the 1970s and 80s. Back then, there were no scientific or political discussions connecting fossil fuels to the climate emergency we face today. Let me begin my story by tracing the roots of atomic power back 100 years. With so much to discuss today, I'll share only a few critical historical aspects that, <clears throat> that presently influence atomic safety. In my story and personal awakening, I'll also weave in my journey as a nuclear whistleblower that began in 1990. Atomic regulation has not and will never protect citizens on our planet. Quite honestly, regulatory capture of nuclear power, a term I had used frequently, never existed. Instead, regulatory collusion created nuclear power. More than 100 years ago, from the late 1890s to 1938, was an exciting period 
in scientific growth in humankind's understanding of the atom. During those 40 years, humankind discovered the atomic nucleus with orbiting electrons, something we take for granted today. The concepts of the theory of relativity, quantum mechanics, uncertainty principle, and radioactivity itself were discovered and freely discussed in scientific literature worldwide. On the political side, while science moved forward, politics moved backward. World War I began and ended. Adolf Hitler and the Nazis drove to power, rose to power in Germany and persecution of the Jewish people had already begun. In 1938, Otto Hahn bombarded uranium with neutrons, yet he didn't understand the test results. A female scientist, Lise Meitner, and her nephew, Otto Frisch, reviewed Hahn's data and concluded that the uranium atom had split in two parts when hit by a neutron. Meitner was the first scientist to understand and calculate the enormous amount of energy produced when uranium atoms split. She calculated that one atom undergoing fission created a million times more energy than one atom undergoing a chemical reaction. Indeed, she and her nephew created the word fission. Meitner was the first scientist to grasp that a new primordial force of nature had been discovered. As an aside, Arohan received the Nobel Prize for his chemical analysis of fission. The Nobel Co Committee made no mention of Meitner's discoveries, naming fission or other theoretical contributions. Unlike Hahn, who worked for the German bomb program, Meitner left Germany and refused to work on any bomb program. Almost immediately, scientists in the US, Western Europe and Russia were enthralled with the power created by splitting atoms. <clears throat> and they had no recognition of its toxic radioactive byproducts. Slide four, please. The scientists focused on the heat produced from fission. That's the bright spot in the center of this slide and not on the radioactive rubble called fission products that were left behind. German and Western scientists really realized they were dealing with a primordial force of the universe. When these discoveries became top secret, the US government eliminated the process of sharing new scientific discoveries through peer reviewed papers. Meitner's ideas right, rapidly came to America as scientists fled the threat of war in Europe by escaping to the US. A shroud of secrecy was created in the US as the race to develop the atomic bomb began in 1939. Building an atomic bomb from uranium is the only scientific technology founded in secrecy as a weapon of mass destruction. Dr. Albert Einstein wrote to US President Franklin Roosevelt in August of 1939, informing the president that the discovery of atomic fission was an opportunity to make bombs more powerful than any weapon ever invented. It stunned me to realize that Einstein wrote to President Roosevelt one month before World War II began in Europe with Germany's invasion of Poland and two and a half years before the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. In his letter, Einstein said, and this is a quote, this new phenomena would also lead to the construction of bombs, that extremely powerful bombs of a new type may thus be created. A single bomb of this type might very well destroy a whole port with some of the surrounding territory. Einstein's letter to Roosevelt began the shroud of secrecy perpetuated by America's military in its founding of the Manhattan Project that began in December of 1942. 
slide five, please. Using this newly discovered primeval force of the universe was never designed to protect people or to create electricity. Splitting the atom and the post-war expansion of atomic energy created weapons of mass destructions, WMDs, to obliterate human beings. The top secret weapons of mass destruction created by the Manhattan Project were the single most expensive project in World War II. Initially, scientists believed that only uranium was fissionable. But in 1942, scientists created plutonium, a new element unknown in nature and named after the god of hell. Plutonium was found to be fissionable and cheaper to produce than enriched uranium. America now had two paths to, wake, to make weapons of mass destruction. Slide six. One bomb that used enriched uranium, 235, was dropped on Hiroshima. And the other, using plutonium, 239, was dropped on Nagasaki. The US government created the Atomic Energy Commission in 1946 to replace military control of the Manhattan Project with, the, with atomic power placed under civilian control. However, the AEC maintained the same level of secrecy and used pr practically all of the same people. Uranium enrichment plants and plutonium, produ plutonium production facilities continue to produce more bomb grade material as instructed by President Harry Truman. Bomb manufacturing and testing continued unabated, thus creating enormous amounts of radioactive waste. These US weapons of mass destruction released primeval forces into the world in 1945 and obliterated 200,000 souls. Slide seven. I visited this shrine in Hiroshima in 2016. It contains the ashes of 70,000 people. J. Robert Oppenheimer, who was considered the father of the atomic bomb, admitted in 1947 that the physicists who worked on the Manhattan Project could never atone for their skin. Quote, in some sort of crude sense, which no vulgarity, no humor, no overestimates can quite extinguish. The physicists have known sin, and this is a knowledge they cannot lose. Slide eight. President Dwight D. Eisenhower announced the, Ato the Atoms for Peace program in 1953 to quote, solve the fearful atomic dilemma by finding some way in which, quote, the miraculous inventiveness of man would not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. I was surprised by Eisenhower's use of the word consecrate, which according to the Oxford Dictionary means to make or declare sacred, dedicate formally to a religious or divine purpose. Please don't under, underestimate the religious overtones of developing these weapons of mass destructions. In an attempt to atone for the so-called original sin of creating weapons of mass destruction, Eisenhower consecrated nuclear fission in the Atoms for Peace program. Yet the civilian atomic program used the same people that originally created the A-bomb in secrecy. That's hardly a fresh start. Even now, a US organization called Christians for Nuclear, whose members work inside the nuclear claim, quote, we believe that God is the creator of the universe, which includes all nuclei, as well as radioactivity and nuclear energy, which we should therefore consider to be his good gifts to mankind. 
we count it a privilege to be involved in investigating and harnessing this source of God-given energy and making it available to benefit humankind." End quote. Before Eisenhower left office, he appointed Glenn Seaborg as chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. Seaborg discovered plutonium and he determined in secrecy that it would cost less to make a plutonium bomb than a uranium bomb. We move slide. Seaborg was the AEC chair during the next 10 years while atomic bomb construction and nuclear power plant development were constructed. Yet during President Eisenhower's farewell address at the end of the presidency, he warned Americans to beware of the military industrial complex, a lesson we still have not learned. And so against the backdrop of atomic, of Adams for Peace, in 1951, I consecrated my career. 1970. I'm sorry, 1971. I'm old, but not that old. I consecrated my career in the atomic priesthood as a newly minted nuclear engineer in the US atomic power industry. This photograph is from 1973. The nuclear industry is enormous, extraordinarily profitable, with tenacious political and legal context in Washington lobbyists and law firms. It shapes the laws that govern it and even controls who Congress appoints to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to oversee it. To be accepted into the atomic priesthood I, as I was, you have to initially believe in regulatory echo chamber. Regulators in the nuke industry use specific language and jargon. Some call it nuke speak to frame all the nuclear concepts inside a predetermined and agreed upon box. We can remove this slide. This predetermined regulatory framework began in 1945 and still exists today anywhere in the world with nuclear power and weapons. Let's quickly look at some of the lexica in place in the US about nuke speak. The nuclear industry uses terms like accident or incident instead of the underlying terms like a disaster, a catastrophe, or a meltdown. During the 1970s, the US government dropped the word atomic. It began to use the word nuclear and disbanded the Atomic Energy Commission to form the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. According to public opinion polls, more people were afraid of the word atomic than nuclear due to their terror over the nuclear bomb. In contrast, the term nuclear had no such negative connotations and instead is seen as a technological advancement. The entire atomic power industry has agreed upon a regulatory framework and technology like design basis accident and maximum credible accident. These have become the basis for nuclear power's design calculations. For example, the American designers of Fukushima built an inexpensive five meter high tsunami wall. And that was considered and they considered that five meter high wall as its maximum credible accident. Unfortunately, the 15 meter tsunami was not informed of the nuclear power analysis when it chose to overwhelm the Fukushima Daiichi site. Colleagues who left the nuclear industry or outsiders who critique it actually call the maximum credible accident the maximum cash available. The DBA and the MCA methodologies allow the construction of inexpensive structures that may easily be overwhelmed by disasters. For those who were once inside the atomic in 
industry and then crossed over, or as whistleblowers, each of us had an epiphany and we realized that this regulatory framework made no sense, that the emperor had no clothes. Let's listen to the words of an engineer at Chernobyl about his epiphany. Quote, we knew with certainty, with arrogant certainty, that we were in control of the power we were playing with. This was the day we learned we were wrong. My epiphany occurred in 1990. I was employed in the nuclear industry as a senior vice president. After 20 years in the industry, I believed the NRC was tough and fair until I became a nuclear whistleblower. Briefly, I uncovered radiation safety violations at Nuclear Energy Services, my employer. I then tried to have the violations corrected by the company. And the, pres and the corporation's president fired me for doing my job. Then I went to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, and I was shocked that it would not support me. The NRC deliberately distorted the follow-up investigation of my safety concerns and supported the company I had worked for. Three years after I began fighting the NRC, I contacted Senator John Glenn the former astronaut and my childhood hero, Senator Glenn held whistleblowing hearings where I testified and I was commended for my actions. Whilst at the same time, Senator Glenn lambasted the NRC. Ivan Selen, then chairman of the NRC, even told Senator Glenn that I was a hero who performed quite a service to my country. But behind the scenes, Selen, a Republican appointee and a significant donor to the Republican Party did absolutely nothing, even after the Inspector General's investigation showed that the NRC personnel had purposely lied and covered up my findings. After the Glenn hearings, a prominent nuclear energy industry attorney and a former colleague told me, Arnie, in this business, you're either for us or against us and you just crossed the line. It was then that I realized that this NRC leopard would never change its spots. The roots of atomic regulation date back in secrecy to creating weapons of mass destruction. While secrecy had blocked public input, the nuclear industry had grown wealthy beyond imagination through intertwined relations between regulators and the military industrial complex. Regulatory capture presupposes that at some point the regulator had been independent. Instead, what I discovered that regulation of the atomic industry was never independent and never protected public health and welfare. Long ago, during the 1940s, nuclear regulatories were not regulators were not captured by the military industry complex. Instead, the regulators colluded with it in secrecy. Here's a couple of examples of the hundreds we could come up with where the nuclear industry has not been captured, but in fact worked in collusion with the industry. Right after the um, atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the United States military swept into Japan. It began its top secret efforts to prevent the publication of any photographs showing the devastation created by the atomic bombs. In 1957, there was a fire at the wind scale re nuclear reactor in the UK. But in 1988, the New York Times surprised the world with an article about Britain's wind scale fire entitled Britain Suppressed Details of the 1957 Atomic Disaster. In 2014, several public advocacy groups concerned about 
the levels of radioactivity caused by wind scales meltdown, asked me to travel to the UK to speak about the meltdown and the Sellafield waste site now located there. Shortly after I arrived, some public officials banned me from speaking at a public venue because my opinions on atomic safety were considered too controversial. Chernobyl. In the Manual for Survival, A Chernobyl's Guide to the Future by Dr. Kate Brown of MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, is based on seven years of research through documents covering details of the Chernobyl meltdown in the Ukraine. The New York Times wrote, quote, her villains include not only the lying, negligent Soviet authorities, but also Western governments and international agencies that in her account have worked for decades to downplay or conceal the human and ecological cost of nuclear war, nuclear tests and nuclear accidents. In 1999, I was invited to the Czech Republic by Hinuti Duha to testify to parliament against the startup of the Temelin reactors, Unit 1 and 2. After my testimony, the government finally permitted us to inspect the Temelin reactors. Before entering the plant, we were intimidated by a strip search. While we were in the plant, we were further intimidated by four guards with fully automatic AK-47s who followed us everywhere while we inspected the reactor for flaws. In March, 2012, Japan's Diet Commission, the Diet is Japan's parliament, released a report on the causes of the triple meltdown of Fukushima Daiichi. Here's a small sampling of what the commission said, quote, as Japan pushed nuclear power generation as a national policy with the political, the bureaucratic and business circles in perfect coordination, an intricate form of regulatory capture was created. Undeniably, this accident was a man-made disaster that stemmed from the lack of a sense of responsibility in protecting the lives of the people and society by present and past government administrators, regulators, and Tokyo Electric Power. Slide 11, please. My wife, Maggie, and I wrote a book in Japanese with barrister Reiko Okazaki about the triple meltdowns in Fukushima. On a speaking tour about the book, I met former Prime Minister Nehru Khan, and he told me, quote, the information I received was neither timely nor accurate. Such a statement aptly explains the power and the arrogance of an industry and its regulators who would so blatantly lie to their own Prime Minister. In conclusion, with its history based on designing weapons of mass destruction in secret, enormous taxpayer fund funding and no public oversight, it's foolish for people around the globe to expect atomic regulators to care about public health and welfare. The leopard cannot change its spots. Let's look back at the creation of the A-bomb and understand through history how weapons of mass destruction, how that weapons of mass destruction mindset created what we have called regulatory capture. We now know that from the beginning, it has been regulatory collusion. Fortunately for all of us on this planet, new technologies in the form of renewables like solar, wind, wave action, and geothermal, battery storage, and conservation are poised to take over our energy economy and end the old atomic paradigm. Slide 12. 
As Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Slide 13. Briefly, that's my credentials. And slide 14. As you well know in Europe, and as Fairwinds has always said, radiation knows no borders. Thank you.